Welcome to the Fitness Oracle, where we have real conversations with real people just like you, with real stories just like yours, and this is one of their stories. I'm your host, John Katsavos. Today, we sit down with Harmony Woodington from Awakened Body. She's a best-selling author of the book, Create a Healthy Romantic Relationship, which came out in January of 2022. Harmony's approach to health and wellness is truly unique. She combines hypnotherapy and intuitive energy work to help love warriors create a harmonious relationship with their mind and body, living a life in service of their divine design. But Harmony's impact goes beyond her one-of-a-kind teachings. She's a proud member of Alita International Consulting, providing everything entrepreneurs and corporate leaders could need. And she works with healthcare providers and specialists to ensure that her clients receive holistic support. In this episode, we talk about kinesiology and optimized health, something that I can geek out on, uh, tapping into subconscious relationships, overcoming, refining fire and thriving, and sexual emp empowerment. We get into a lot of really interesting and deep topics in this episode. So I really do hope that all of you can uh, get some, some value out of it. If you're a podcaster, a live streamer, or content creator looking to find balance in your life while putting out top-notch content consistently, Harmony's teachings can help you achieve your goals. Another way is to join the Podcaster Wellness Alliance. We are looking to bring on experts like Harmony to offer their guidance and support to help you reach your full potential. So after you listen to this show, click on the link in the show notes, and uh, I'll see you guys on the inside. Until then, enjoy the show. Harmony, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I'm absolutely excited to be here. Um, how's Vancouver? You're in Vancouver, right? Yes, yeah, I am. We actually just got hit with snow yesterday for the first time this season. And of course, Vancouver's version of snow is literally slush and it's melted the next day. So it doesn't really count, but <laughs> everybody was so excited about the snow. They got stuck in traffic for 11 hours. Oh my there were God. some people make it home from work and the sun was coming up and and the commuters were coming into work and there were some people that never even made it home so it was uh anarchy and I'm just really glad that my commute is uh, a walk to my office from my bedroom so <laughs> <laughs> well you should hop over the mountain they should hop over the mountain to go to Calgary to see the snow there oh this is nothing compared well that's the thing is Vancouver isn't used to snow so we don't really have the infrastructure so when it does snow the whole city comes to a standstill it's tragic to be honest <laughs> <laughs> if you looked outside you'd be like that's harmony that's not snow what are you even talking about I see slush <laughs> <laughs> yeah I'm not happy to go back to big smoke with all the snow that they're expecting oh I yeah Toronto is a whole other beast. Yeah. Anyhow, um, I always start off the podcast with just asking you, um, asking my guests what got them interested in uh, their line of work. So what got you interested in your line of work? What was that spark? <laughs> it's so funny the way that you asked that question, because it's one of those things that it's like, it wasn't really something in particular um, that got me interested in my work. It was actually my own childhood trauma and psychological issues that I came out of being in a massively dysfunctional family that forced me to find resolution that created awareness that other people struggle too. And there's a much more expedited way to get resolution than the path that I walked that created the passion um, really as to what it is that I'm doing today. So it came from, it came from my own personal hurt. How interesting. How interesting. <laughs> I, you know what I say, I say 
how interesting, not in a very bad way, because I think a lot of us in the health and wellness spaces, we've kind of are doing what we're doing because of our past childhood experiences, which we're probably going to get into a little bit later on in the show. Um, Have there any, have there ever been any moments where you just said, you know what, screw this. I'm not doing this anymore. I'm just going to go grab a nine to five and just numb my way to oblivion. No, no. Um, And the reason for that is, is because the way that I discovered what I meant to do in this life was on my own healing journey. And these were answers that came to me either in a state of hypnosis or, you know, in deep meditation. And because I sourced the answers myself um, and it became so incredibly clear to me that this was a path that I chose for myself, that the pain, the trials, the tribulations, the refining fires that I walked through helped to create awareness, to prepare me for being and doing what I'm meant to do in this life, it is at the core of my being, which means that it is the only thing that matters to me in this life is to be doing what I'm doing. And I'm I'm not saying this to be callous towards my love relationship or my child or any of that, because the people who are in my world mean everything to me. However, they are secondary to my divine design, to my soul's purpose. So there is nothing that will stop me from doing what I'm meant to do in this life. So I don't look at failure as being a thing. I don't look at roadblocks as being a thing that slows me down. When something comes my way and presents a challenge, I'm like, sweet, I'm I'm just gonna bust through it and I'm gonna figure it out and I'm gonna pivot and whatever. Like, it's just, it's not an option to quit. Mm-hmm. Um, you said something there that I wanna ask you about. You, you talked about hypnosis, that you, you discovered your, your, your path through hypnosis. Now I've always been skeptical, skeptical about hypnosis. I don't allow anybody to hypnotize me because I'm afraid to be uh, barking like a dog. Every time I hear a doorbell ring, like, I don't want to be the, uh, you know, that thing. So how can you, um, what word of advice could you give somebody to, to help them understand I have done hypnosis and I do see the benefit under hypnosis. I have done it. Um, and it changed my view on it, but how, what would you say to somebody to, uh, who's still skeptical about hypnosis? Yeah, this is something that I think was really big for me when I discovered, uh, hypnotherapy when I was training. And the thing that was really important that we learned right from the very beginning is that you are significantly more suggestible to yourself than anyone else. And so a hypnotherapist's job is to actually listen to their client, to learn their languaging, to actually feed it back to them. So it's actually not the hypnotherapist that is putting their own languaging or suggestions on you. We are listening to what it is that you want to create and putting it back into your mind in a suggestive state. So This is what's really beautiful to understand is that the power is 100% yours. And all we're doing as a hypnotherapist is, is helping you to tap into your own power, to utilize what your beautiful mind is already doing. Just think about this for a second. Your mind is changing molecular structure. Every moment of the day, when you eat something, it goes into your body and it changes the molecular structure of what you just ingested to turn it into hair, nails, and skin and ligaments and bone and tissue and cells. And how is our body doing that? We have no idea how we do it. We just do it. We're that amazing. So when you utilize the brilliance of the part of the mind that is doing that, that you can't even begin to to understand, then you're tapping into your power to really meet your current agenda to create success, to help others, to invest in your dream, to do whatever it is that you want to do in your life. Does that make sense? Yeah, 100%. 100%. Like I didn't know what I was getting myself into. I thought it was just a waste of money, but I just have this weird feeling that everything that is, has been suggested to me during that hip, hip, the hypnosis, uh, sessions that I had with this, uh, hypnotherapist, uh, I have a feeling somehow, some way it's actually working its way. And, uh, 
while it's scary and while I don't want to do some of the stuff that I have to do, um, I know that's what I need to do to get to where I want to be. That's really beautiful. It's it's really important to really understand just how suggestible we are in so many ways. If you think about a person um, who is doing, let's call it future prediction, right? There's people that play in the spiritual space and they're claiming to predict your future. In my mind, I'm just going to let you know right now, I see that as unethical. Um, and the reason for that is, is because all realities exist, all futures exist. Uh, nothing is set in stone until it has happened. The only thing that's real is the present moment and the past that we've experienced. So the reason that a predicted future actually becomes reality is because you become suggestible seeing that person as an authority. You take on the suggestion into your subconscious mind and then your subconscious mind makes it a reality. But because the subconscious mind does it, the conscious mind registers it as the person who predicted it as making it true, not you making it true. Mm -hmm. um, speaking of the subconscious, uh, I recently had a, an, another guest on and we were talking about tapping, the power of tapping. Yeah. Now, um, how does that work? Like we, she had her perspective. I want to get your perspective on tapping and do you tap and how often do you tap? I don't, I don't tap at all. So when it comes to things from a physiological perspective, like tapping, um, it's really something that is really supporting a person anchoring the belief that what they're doing is supporting them because we are having this physical existence. We believe that ritual or systems and processes that invoke or involve physical objects make whatever it is that we're doing more tangible which allows for the believability or the shift uh, in perspective in our own mind. That being said, we actually don't need any physical things to shift our mindset at all. We really don't. It's, it, can, that, it can be some more simple than that. The thing that really matters is that whatever systems and process it is that you're utilizing to create that shift, you have to believe that it is creating a shift. I'm going to share a quick story that a client shared with me two days ago in my group coaching that I thought was such a beautiful example of this. So she was, she was wanting to move on and she was uh, listening to a, a podcast that talks about attracting a new partner. And this particular um, host was suggesting that you check the energy in your space and clear the energy. And she was suggesting using a rolling pin to beat the energy out of your bed. <laughs> because there might be some negative energy from past lovers or whatever, right? And so she's got this whole like beating the bed ritual with a rolling pin and that's supposed to clear the energy. Now, if the person takes on the suggestion that doing this physical thing is going to shift the energy, then it will. What matters is that it was an intention. So she didn't have a rolling pin. So she used a potato masher. <laughs> so she's like, I'm a potato masher beating my bed, like king size bed. And I'm like, I'm dying listening to this. I love it so much. And I had her at the root of the work that I do to make things a little more tangible is I'll have my clients to self-communicate with kinesiological testing. So I asked her, were you suggestible to this and did doing this ritual with the potato masher clear the energy of your bed? And she muscle tested and it was a yes. And I said, I want you to understand that it wasn't necessarily specifically using the potato masher that did it. <laughs> And it was your intention to clear the energy that did it. We just have an attachment to the tangible ritual that makes us feel like something really happened when we engage something physical. Does that make sense? It does make sense. And uh, as humans, we, uh, we actually do have a lot of symbolisms that we hold on to, a lot of rituals that we hold on to, no matter what people believe in. Everybody, if you believe in anything, uh, even if you believe in nothing, um, there's a, there's symbols and rituals that help explain our existence and bringing it into one is, is, is a very powerful tool when used positively. Yeah. Yeah. So tapping is effective because people believe it's effective. That being said, it's not more effective than one using intention either. You know what I mean? 
Yes, absolutely. 100%. Um, switching gears a little bit, uh, you know quite a bit about kinesiology, and I, I, and I love that. I, lo I absolutely love that. I, study of the human body is one of my geeky, nerdy passions. Um, I want to get your take on how you use kinesiology to optimize people's health and wellness. So at the root of uh, the kinesiology that I learned was uh, a doctor named Dr. Bradley Nelson, and he was working with clients for about 20 years, and he would find that the clients would keep coming in complaining about pain, and he was uh, practicing chiropractic medicine, and he was finding that this repetition was really like, you know, it was making him money, but he wasn't getting long-term resolution for his clients. And so he kind of decided to experiment using the foundation of his education, which is kinesiology, uh, to really start to kind of play with things on a different level. Now, Dr. George Goodhart, who originally actually discovered kinesiology in 1960, which later was developed into that, was also a, a chiropractic practitioner. So of course, when Dr. Bradley Nelson was looking at this, he was like, okay, so we know that Dr. George Goodhart, when he first discovered this, actually discovered a, a physiological shift in a client before he had even done any physical manipulation. And that was when he was like, question mark, what? How did that even, I didn't do anything. This is Okay. And then so he went on this path to understand how there could have been a physiological shift in strength without there being a physical manipulation, right? And what that means and what they came to understand is that we are, and we know that this is now proven through quantum physics, vibrating energy. We are nothing about us is static, which means that when the vibration of something else comes into contact with our vibration, it weakens us or strengthens us. There's actually a, a series that just came out um, telling the history about swear words. And they've actually scientifically proven when you use the F word, your grip strength goes up 10%. What? That's so cool. So what's really fascinating about that is that it's been proven that just an intention, a spoken word gives you more strength. So when you think about that, this whole uh, kinesiology and the study of it can be utilized in so many ways. Now, obviously, with the work that you do, it would be more about finding weaknesses and strengths in the body to then uh, train with a client to help them to strengthen those weaknesses. For me, I'm actually using kinesiological testing to help my clients to self-communicate. So that is typically through asking yes or no questions. And when it's a no, our vibration drops. When it's a yes, our vibration actually goes up. And so we will be stronger. And the basis of this is rooted in Dr. Bradley Nelson, but also in Dr. David R. Hawkins' uh, research, which he did for, for decades and published many books on. And he published something called the map of consciousness, which is how we vibrate on a scale of zero to a thousand. And you can use kinesiological testing to actually see where you vibrate on that scale or where somebody that you potentially want to do business with, be friends with, or get romantic with vibes on that scale and stuff as well. So it's this really beautiful, beautiful world that allows for you to be able to tap into yourself, your own brilliance, and then also to tap into the vibration of what you're surrounding yourself by. You can tap into the universe. You can tap into your animals and have conversations with them. You can tap in to see how vi high vibration your food is to see if it's actually going to uh, raise your energy and support you because the food has a vibration as well. The list goes on. It's a, it's a massive, massive tool that could support you in so many ways. And the fact that it was discovered in 1960 and it's 2023 almost and everybody on this planet isn't using it, I'm a little confused. <laughs> well, I'll be, I'm very confused in why well, actually this hasn't been, this has been around since the ancient Egyptians. There's been a uh, high hieroglyphic, uh, ev hieroglyphic evidence that the ancient Egyptians were actually using kinesiology methods, muscle testing, range of motion tests way back then. And, uh, I have my own theory about why, and well, we're just going to just how about you're just like we're just gonna yep there's an agenda 
I've been kicked off of Facebook too many times. <laughs> <laughs> I am I am very much with you when it comes to that. I, I very much do firmly believe that there uh, is an agenda that is uh, inhibiting us from tapping into our own power and our own divine design and our own uh, brilliance because we're just much better uh, consumers and we do what we're told when we're following somebody else's agenda and not being independent and kinesiological testing and learning how to self-communicate is uh, really an enemy of, uh, you know, turning somebody into a sheeple it just doesn't help. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. I've been experimenting with muscle tests for past, I'd say seven years now. Um, I've tested it with meridians. I've tested it with foods. I've tested it with, with everything that you can possibly imagine. The, um, the one thing that I actually found that could actually give you a false positive was thoughts. If you get the person to think that they're strong, they will be strong. Yep. If you think, if you get them to think that they're weak, they will come out weak. So it's like a false positive. When you do these kind of tests, what do you tell your clients um, what, when you do the test? That's actually not a false positive. I wouldn't call it a false positive because if you are telling yourself you're weak, you are weak. You've just told yourself you're weak, right? And if you're telling yourself you're strong, you are strong. So this is actually direct evidence of what you're telling yourself you're creating, right? Um, and that's incredibly important to know. So when people are getting tripped up when it comes to self-communicating about things, a lot of the time the trip up actually is in internal dialogue resistance. So let's just say there's a beautiful story that I was actually, uh, that I love to share because it's a very simple example of how um, kinesiological testing can get confused. So my client wanted to get a new car. Her car broke down and it was time to get a new one. And she had a Highlander. And this is an SUV for people who aren't really car people. It's it's a it's a cute little SUV. So uh, she works on a garlic farm and she needed a decent sized vehicle, but something that was kind of go to. And so she was like, you know, I was really thinking about getting this newer Highlander and it's still used, but it's, it's new to me. And I, I kind of like it. But when I was muscle testing, whether I should get a new car or a used car, I was muscle testing. Yes, for a new car. And so I'm kind of confused. And I said, okay, what we want to do is actually listen to your internal dialogue. So I actually got her to test, um, to communicate with which age of herself that's showing up. So when you're talking to yourself, you at any age or any aspect of you can show up to join in on the conversation. Okay. And so if you're not directing what aspect or age of self you're communicating with, anything is going to show up and it could be, it could be anarchy. Okay. So she actually had a three-year-old version of herself show up and I can telepathically connect to my clients and actually hear what they're saying. And this is how I actually help my clients to, uh, to actually access their own internal dialogue is I connect to them I hear what it is and then I guide them towards accessing it themselves without giving it to them because I want them to own their own power. So if I just give it to you, you're not going to learn how to do it yourself. But what we did access was that the three-year-old was saying, well, if the car is new or used, it's new to me. <laughs> and I, she's like, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> and, oh, this is where it's really important. If you really want to have clarity and you don't want that confusion, don't leave the door open for five-year-old you to show up and say, I want Smarties. Uh, there's no Smarties in the States. I want whatever, wherever it is that you are, right? This is what's really important is that if you really want to access information as to what is going to support your higher self, or you want answers that are that are really going to support you moving forward, then what you would want to do is self-communicate and say, I would like to talk to the, the divine me, the, the, the all-knowing me. And then you can muscle test yes to that. Once you know you're talking to the divine you, the answers that you're going to get are obviously going to be in your highest good, mature, you know, more clear, 
But that being said, I mean, if you want to have a conversation with five-year-old you about something from your childhood, that's also great too, right? Also, this is what's really cool that a lot of people don't think about. You can have a conversation with the logical aspect of you, if you want to get logical about something, the creative aspect of you, if you want to get into your creative space, right? There's different aspects of yourself, depending on what you're wanting to create or do in your life that you can actually tap into to access to support whatever it is that you're doing. That's interesting. So it's more like um, trying to figure out what kind of relationship that you have with yourself so you can come up with a logical solution not logical most solutions are not logical anyways everybody knows that especially guys we don't make logical well we do make logical solutions just a lot of people don't think that yeah <laughs> and, the, and this is the thing nobody's testing wrong nobody's ever testing wrong when i work with my clients i had a client that i was uh asking yesterday in my group coaching uh she was testing no to a particular thing that we were asking about now i was twinging that she was testing no because there was resistance, which means that it's important for the person or for the healer to be intuitively picking up on the off vibration of the answer that isn't wrong. She didn't answer wrong because her subconscious mind is saying, I, I don't want to give this stuff up because I'm if I'm resolved, I don't know what it's going to look like on the other side. And I feel safe here. So no, I'm not giving you anything. <laughs> And it's, it, it is a deliberate answer. It's not wrong. It's just as the practitioner, it's my job to pick up on the vibration of that, to feel the resistance and go, I hear what you're saying. However, can you please muscle test and ask if there's resistance and look at that? Yeah, there is. Okay, cool. Let's speak to the resistance so that that can be released so that we can then surface what needs to be surfaced and released. Just out of curiosity, what kind of muscle test do you use for that? Because I do so many muscle tests. I'm just, I'm just curious. Yeah. So when I'm working with my clients, I actually take them through the gambit of different tests that you can utilize. Um, there is the, the finger pulse. So you're doing two rings with uh, the index finger and the thumbs and then pulling them apart. Uh, there's creating a ring with one hand and then kind of pinchers with the other, putting it in from the outside and trying to open it. Um, there's the index finger where you put the middle finger on it and try to push it down, which is kind of like the mini equivalent of pushing on the arm. Um, there's also the flick test, which is something I created to make life easier because I quantify numbers and all sorts of things a lot. So I use a flick test. Uh, there's the sway test with, I think, I think a lot of people in kinesiology know that one's way too slow. And I just don't, I, I don't want to hold something in a grocery store and then close my eyes and be like, People are going to be looking at me like, what the actual is she doing right now? <laughs> so, you know, there's, there's so many different ways to muscle test. And I go through the whole gambit of testing and I tell my clients to pick what feels right for you right now. And then as you get to know and get more familiar with the self-communication, if you want to change it up to make it easier or you're bored with it, or maybe you're muscle testing too much and your wrist is getting sore, you can, you can totally change it up. So all of them work. It's just what feels right for the individual. All right, cool. I usually tell, I usually do the, uh, the lap pole test with, oh, okay. the, with the arm out. And, uh, yeah. it's, it's funny. Cause uh, when you do it in the supermarket, you walk up to a person, pull my arm, pull my arm. And they're like, Oh, <laughs> I did have a practitioner, a naturopathic doctor that was using my leg. Um, and he would have me like, um, I was laying on the bed and he would have me, uh, push my leg out and then he would push on the outside of my, uh, calf and I would have to resist and he would feel the strength that way. That's the only time I've ever seen it, uh, being done that way. So I think all different practitioners have different ways of, um, testing muscle strength, um, based on a certain kind of stimulus and, if that's what was working for the doctor, if he wanted to play with my leg, cool beans. I, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's part of, part of the, what I, what we call globals. It's uh, you're trying to test the leg in um, uh, frontal plane, frontal plane and transverse plane. And uh, then you go directly to uh, frontal plane with both legs. A anyways, anyways, anyways. And the yeah, arms see, that's and the everything. Thing. So. There's so many different ways to do it and it's all beautiful and perfect the way that it is. Yeah. Um, let's switch gears and talk about a little bit about relationships, because this is a big one, especially with, um, uh, you know, with guys, guys have, 
I don't want to say guys have a, a dysfunctional look at relationships. We have our own look at relationships. Um, one of the big things that we have and we get called out on is lack of communication. Yeah. And it's not that we don't want to communicate. It's just sometimes we like having our brains in the empty box. The nothing um, box. The nothing box. Oh, I know the, the nothing, nothing box. box. Yeah. And women do not respect the nothing box. They get infuriated when men are in the nothing box. Oh, yeah. Because <laughs> we don't have one. <laughs> What's really beautiful about what you're saying is that one, it's very important for a woman to actually respect a man's time in his nothing box. Um, and just because we don't have one doesn't mean that we need to get jealous and bitchy over it. You know what I mean? Um, because it does happen a lot when a guy is potentially they're staring at a screen, but really there's, they don't even know what they're watching because they're in the nothing box. And a woman just sits, looks at a man doing nothing and is infuriated because she can't do that, right? Um, that being said, it's incredibly important to actually honor that because it is really how a man recharges. And I think men and women both have a lot of pressure on them for different reasons. And this is important recharge time for a man. And I think that if you can communicate as a couple about that, if a woman has the desire for a man to want to do something to support her, if there's a honeydew list to be done or whatever, and, it, and the honeydew list can be really relevant, it's important to kind of, you know, communicate and say, hey, I totally respect your downtime. When do you think it would be reasonable for me to ask you to do a few things? And then he can say, you know what, I want to be in my nothing box for another half an hour and then I'll get to your honeydew list. Then it's a beautiful exchange because the man is honoring the woman's needs and the woman is then honoring the man's nothing box and his recharge time, right? There is a purpose for it. The other thing that I wanted to call out really quickly is the fact that, you know, we understand that through so many generations of society, men really are allowed to have two emotions. You're allowed to be happy or you're allowed to be angry. So if you have any of the others, they better be one of these two, right? Yep. <laughs> and so what could be a different emotion uh, does end up coming out as anger because it's what's acceptable or your man card is going to get checked or they're going to check what's in your pants. So, you know, as a, as a woman, if we can understand the pressures that have been put on men, particularly in the different environments that they're raised in, my partner that I've been with for almost 10 years was raised on a farm and it was unacceptable to have emotions and feelings about things at all. And so he really, really struggled to communicate with me. And I noticed when he was trying to talk to me, it was like the feelings and the thoughts were there. And I could feel it was like pulling teeth, him trying to find a way to translate what was in his brain to come out his mouth properly. And I had to really sit back and just listen. And then what I would do to support him was actually mirror him, which means speaking back what he was saying. And a lot of the time when I would speak it back, he'd be like, no, listen to what I mean. You know what I said. And I'm like, okay, cool. So I'm going to become a translator then. So I would just keep playing it back until he was then hearing what he was trying to say, not what was coming out of his mouth. And I would just be really gentle with him. And over a period of time, you know, all, almost 10 years now, he has gotten better at expressing his feelings. And he did say to me actually that there should be a warning label that comes with a harmony because when he left the farm, he had two feelings and now he has thousands and he doesn't do it all. <laughs> um, he's right. I'm, uh, and you're right. Uh, we do, we only have two, we're only allowed to express two emotions and we have to be that stoic rock all the time. And it, it it's hard, like all of a sudden, I'd say over the past, what, 15, 20 years, maybe a little bit longer, maybe 25, 30 years, all of a sudden, it's like, it's okay for men to cry. It's, it's like, what? what are you talking about? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I will. Like if You're I'm vulnerable. like, yeah, if, if I'm by myself and there's nobody in the house and I'm going through a really bad time and I know no one's going to be in the house for the next couple of hours, I may break down. Yeah. You know who's going to know? Nobody but me and God. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it, it's, it's, uh, 
it's a new thing. Like for last, like I said, 30 years compared to the last 30 eons. So many generations. Yeah. So many generations. It's like, we're the hunters, we're the gatherers. We're supposed to feel nothing. And when we start to feel something and we get thrown it in our face, guess what? Those two emotions, they're both of them are going to be gone because we're going to be gone. Yeah. Yeah. I totally respect that. And that's, I think what's really beautiful about us really honoring the struggle for, you know, women and the healing that needs to happen for women, the, you know, uh, sexual abuse that women have suffered, the disempowering, you know, the fact that women were treated as a piece of property that were bought and sold and had no independence and how important it is to hold space for that. And also how important it is to hold space for men and the pressure and the struggles and everything that they've had to go through. And like you said, having to be this rock, not being allowed to have emotions or be weak or fall apart at all ever, you know, and, and that this idea of a man has always for a very long time, like we're talking like Roman times has been the fierce, strong soldier. And that was the ideal man because they wanted all the, the men in the village or wherever to try to become that because if they, if all the men looked like that and were strong and fierce, they could send them off to battle at any time and they'd go and kick some rear, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, that is lingering from those days, you know, when people used to be sent off to war all the time. And that is now translated into, well, Chris Hemsworth. <laughs> you know what I mean? And he's not exactly going and kicking rear. He's, he's on TV as the ideal hottie. And so you get all of these guys still that are, are idealizing that. And if they don't represent that, they don't feel like a man because that is what a man is supposed to be. And so in my work, I deal with a lot of guys that struggle with their identity as a man because they, they can't fit into that. They're too skinny and they can't put on enough weight or they're shorter. And so they, they can't be six feet tall like he is. And so there's all of these struggles and it very much translates to the romantic relationship and their inability to show up because they don't feel like they can fill that capacity as that, that man. And the fact that there are actually movies that are starting to come out that are showing what they call the beta male, the softer male, and really showing that off. There's a few that I can think of that were just so beautifully done and, and that celebrate the softness of a man and the warmth and the nurturing nature that a man can have. There's been a lot of negativity in the publicity about that, that happening. And yet at the same time, there's another camp that's going, finally, you know, we're starting to celebrate the diversity within a male and, and that being a male isn't just going out and kicking butt and, and like all the guys did in 300 it also can be a softer, loving, nurturing male. And that is a beautiful aspect of being a man. But there has to be a limit to that too, because nobody likes a beta. I'll be honest with you. All the women out there, I know, uh, I was a beta for a very long time. I just don't care what people label me as anymore. I don't care. You want to yeah. put me as an alpha? You want to put me as a beta? You want to put me as a gamma, a delta, epsilon, Zeta, Ita, Yota, Kappa, Lambda, Mi, Nick, C, Omicron, Piro, whatever you want, just label me. I don't care. I know I know most of the Greek alphabet, not all of it. <laughs> no, that was pretty solid. I think the thing that really matters is that we're not looking at each other as alpha, beta. This is more societal language that I'm using. I and my personal relationship don't exist that way. There isn't an alpha and a beta in my relationship. There is not a sub or a dom in my relationship. We don't play with those dynamics. My partner and I are equal. I have my own strengths in who I am as a woman, in my personality and what I want to pursue. And he has his own strengths in who he is, his personality and being a man. The dude outweighs me by 60 pounds. He could throw me around with no issue. Like, you know what I mean? So if it was a strength competition, he'd be the alpha. Personality wise, however, I'm the leader. I'm more entrepreneurial and a self-starter and stuff like that. So who's the alpha? It doesn't matter. It's, it's not about that. We both balance each other. We both complement each other. I want to be in the limelight. I want people to know my name. 
he has zero desire for anyone to know his name. And he has said that he is perfectly happy supporting me being that person in the limelight. And how did I end up with somebody that has that desire to just show up and support me doing that, right? It's it's so beautiful and perfect the way that it is. So if we can, instead of thinking, well, I don't want a beta male because that's just not manly and ran, 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 and nick people apart, really kind of look at what is it that makes me beautiful and amazing and wonderful and stand in your own power and find someone who is also standing in their power and loves themselves and is confident and is tapping into their own brilliance and come together and complement each other. But here's why he supports you. And I'll tell you exactly why he supports you. It's because you support him. Yeah, absolutely. So there's, absolutely. he sees the reciprocation of you supporting him. So he's like, fine, she's, she's got my back. That means I got her back. And he there's had a lot. My back first. He totally had my back first. When he met me, I was concussed and had severe injuries from a car accident. And he showed up and made my life easier when I was really incapacitated. And he showed me that there was no end that I could ask for support. I could ask for the hot water bottle or a head massage or whatever it was. And, and he would show up for me and that man showed me unconditional love before I was capable of giving it myself because of the wounding that I had. And as a result of that, as I healed, I returned the favor as well. And so we've been able to create that um, mutual exchange as I've healed, but he met me very incapacitated. So I wasn't, I wasn't truly capable of reciprocating in the beginning of our relationship. It was really, I want to say it was all him in the beginning. And that's how it's supposed to be. Yeah. I mean, if you're dealing with one person in the relationship that's incapacitated, sure. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, incapacitation can has different faces. I'm going to call them, but I'll yeah. give you an example with my ex, with my ex fiance. Um, I always showed up for her middle of a snowstorm Sunday, Sunday morning at 6 AM. I was in my car driving to her house to pick her up from her house to drive her to work because she yeah. couldn't get the she couldn't get the transit yeah then i would go pick her up from work and drop her off at her home she kept pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing there was no reciprocation on her end to support me in what i was doing so i think that's the big difference like i wasn't I wasn't capable of, of reciprocating from a, like a physical standpoint by taking care of him the way that he was taking care of me. That being said, I expressed constant gratitude for the way that he showed up for me and I showed up for him in the ways that I could, right? Like when, when his father was diagnosed with liver cancer in 2015 and ended up in the hospital and he actually ended up losing his job in Fort Mac and he came to live with me and I was paying the bills and taking care of him. So when it was my turn to show up, I had his back. I absolutely took care of him. That being said, two years prior, when we started dating, there was no shortage of love and appreciation and gratitude when he did show up for me. And I think that's one of the big things is we don't always have the ability to reciprocate right away. Um, but showing gratitude and appreciation for that person and finding ways to give back in, in the way that you can. And then when a situation shows up where you then can show up to the capacity that your partner has been showing up for you, show up. Absolutely. And, and over 10 years almost, we've done that for each other. You know, when it's my turn, he's got my back. And when it's his turn, I've got his back. Absolutely. It is, it is reciprocating for sure. And that's great. I mean, I'm, I'm like, I'm to the moon for you, both of you. I am. <laughs> I'm to the moon for the both of you because it's very rare. It's very rare. I I've been struggling my entire adult life to find something like that. And it's so rare. It's always uh, Chris Rock put up a, a Chris Rock has an old stand up skit. Uh, there's only three people. There's only three types of beings that are that will all that will I'm paraphrasing right now that will only uh, find unconditional love women children and dogs men will be loved on the condition that they can provide some value to the other person wow that's 
It's an interesting perspective because the way that I actually look at things and the way that I train my clients to think about things is actually showing up with unconditional love for all things and in all circumstances and in all places before anyone's done anything to, to, to prove themselves, right? So when I'm interacting with anyone, whether it's a client, a, a potential friend or whoever it is, it doesn't matter. I am showing up with unconditional love because I already see that person as a divine being having a human experience. And I know that whatever they're going to be and do in this human experience is just a reflection of their experiences in this life. It's not them ever trying to attack me or any of that kind of stuff. It's not personal. So I can accept them exactly the way that they are. And I'm already self-fulfilled. And so I'm not looking to them to fill a void for me or provide anything for me. So I'm there giving them love and allowing them to do whatever they're going to do. And the question that I'm asking myself when people behave the way they're inevitably going to behave is how do I respond with love? And what am I going to do from a place of self-love for myself, right? Keep them in my life or send them packing. So this enables me to, you know, show up for everyone in that way. And I think if we could learn how to be more that way, showing up with unconditional love, giving people free agency to do what's right for them, and then making the right choices as to whether we're going to cherry pick that person into our life or not, I think is a much better way to allow for everyone to bathe in unconditional love. 100%. I'm, a, I'm on board with you with that. I'm so on board with you with that. But that takes a lot of uh, self-reflection on what do I want and how can someone fulfill, not fulfill my needs, but fulfill my being. And I think that's a big question that we're all missing. When you say, how can someone fulfill my being? Are you saying like someone that you would get into a relationship with? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. See, I don't see it that way. So when it comes to uh, fulfilling your being, that's your job, right? So it is my job to fill my own heart with universal love. It is my job to create a sense of security internally, to know that I am everything that I need should any of my external circumstances change. And that means my relationship, my home, my career, my business, my family, whatever it is, I can thrive regardless of it, which gives everyone in my life free agency to be in it or not be in it. And it is of no consequence to me. I'm not gonna try to bind and control anyone for a sense of safety and security because I don't need them for that because I know I'm good. And my worth being sourced within knowing that I'm a divine being having a human existence, that also puts me in a place where again, I'm not seeking external worth or validation from anyone. I see my partner as a compliment, not a completer. I do not ask my partner to make me happy. It is not his job. His job is to make himself happy. It is my job to make myself happy. He cheerleads me in creating a life in service of myself. I cheerlead him in creating a life in service of himself. And because both of us are so awesome, we actively choose each other. Do you see what I mean? And that's one yeah. of the reasons why I don't ever want to get married because I want the freedom to actively choose my man every day and vice versa right? Because we have the freedom to do so. And we're choosing each other because both of us are cultivating our own beautiful, loving, internal ecosystem, which makes us so much sexier to each other. Now, without getting like, I have my views on marriage, and I'm sure you have your views on your uh, on marriage. And I, I, I respect everybody's views on, you know, how they choose to live their life. But don't you think just you being married to one person would amplify that because we have, I, we, we have this belief uh, in Greek orthodoxy. We have this belief that uh, marriage is the, um, the ritual of two beings becoming one, two souls uniting into becoming one bigger soul. Yeah. So for me, that's a very beautiful, beautiful way of ex explaining what happens during a marriage. What are your views on that? So I come from a background uh, 
obviously, you know, British background and everything where marriage means uh, that a woman is being bound and controlled and sought and bought and sold and has no power. And so my roots being uh, in that, that is kind of, I think, where I was looking at everything and questioning it and pulling away from it and going, I will never be bound and controlled. I'm not a piece of property to be bought and sold. Um, so I'm going to claim my freedom and yeah, no, I'm not signing any paperwork. That's going to bind me to some dude. It's not happening. And, <laughs> and really in all reality, when you look at the way that we've been practicing marriage for so many generations, I'm just going to say, it's not going very well if we have more than a 50% divorce rate. So maybe we should try something else and see if something else works, you know? And so this is me questioning society and practicing my relationship in a way that other people don't to see what is a fit for me. And so far being in a relationship where I have the freedom to actively choose my partner and I don't try to bind or control him at all in any way, he actually has the freedom to go out and do what he wants to do as well. And he actively chooses to come home to me on the regular and is so proud to be with me. So that freedom that we give each other in the relationship is beautiful for the two of us. And I very much firmly believe that regardless as to whether we were to go through a ritual or not, after almost a decade, our souls are absolutely bound. There's no two ways about it for sure. So when it comes to marriage, when I'm working with my clients, what I do in every aspect of their lives really is I ask them to dismantle everything because most of what we do in life is actually programmed and we're not even asking ourselves why we do it. You ask a person why they want to get married and they're like, well, because that's what you do. Oh, cool. That's a good answer. Why do you want to get married? I don't know. Cause that's what you're supposed to do. Okay, cool. Could you give me a different answer? Like if you don't if you don't have a real reason why you want to get married outside of that's what you do, check yourself, question yourself, question it. Mm -hmm. And because a lot of people get married to get married and they actually don't think about the person they're getting married to. And then it's a disaster. And then they walk away and go, why did I want to do it? Before you walked into it, you know what I mean? So if a person that I work with dismantles everything and then goes, you know what? I want monogamy. I want to be with one person. I want to get married. And this is what it means to me. Then I'll go, amen. Yes, get it. Because now they're doing things on their based on their own agenda with clarity, understanding for themselves why they want to do something, not just being a sheeple and doing what they've been told to do. Actually, the divorce rate is closer to 75%. Yeah, dope. Since COVID, I can understand that. There you go. <laughs> um, so and that's something else. That well, that's based. That's based off of, like you said, uh, marrying the wrong person, not finding the right person for you, and not making that thing. And obviously, there's the big difference between growing up in a British back, uh, British heritage compared to a Greek heritage. Every single Greek guy knows Greek men are not a, not in charge of the house. It's the wife that's in charge. The wife is even in charge of the men too. So it's like. Yeah. Yeah. It just depends on the culture that you come from. Right. And because that's the roots of where I come from, that's what I'm questioning, dismantling, and then redefining for myself. And it doesn't matter what culture you come from. Um, I want everyone that I work with to tear their culture apart, all of their belief systems and then decide what aspects of their culture they want to play in or not, because all cultures have flaws and all cultures have beautiful teachings. And it's up to you what you want to perpetuate or let go of. Yeah, I, I started doing that a little bit with my culture and I, I, I was baffled as to why my name is John and not Odysseus or Achilles or... Uh, Heracles, or, yeah. so, or, you know, because John is not a Greek name. John no. is an, is a Jewish name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, That's... and a lot of our traditions came from the Middle East anyways. That's the different podcast for a different time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're coming up close to the end of the show. 
And these are the seven or eight questions I ask all my guests. I'd just like to get your perspective on these seven or eight topics. With the increase in people suffering from depression from the constant uncertainty that we've been living in through the last two and a half to three years, what would be the one thing that you could tell them to keep their hopes up? When it comes to people that struggle from depression, that's a person who is recluse and in a dark cloud and, you know, believes that their mindset, um, their struggles and their challenges is a burden to the people around them. I very much implore people that are in that struggle to find themselves a, a tribe, even if it's only a couple of people that are going to be there unconditionally for them and push them and reach out to them when they're feeling like they don't want to reach out and are going to support them in those times when they're feeling their mental health is um, really, really struggling. The other thing that I really want to say to anyone who's, you know, dealing with depression is that learning how, how to self-communicate when that depression comes as to how much time you want to allow yourself to bathe in it is actually important to do because a person who's struggling with depression doesn't actually know when to step out of it. Being in emotion and honoring your emotion is healthy. We need to learn when to then step out of it and look to a healer to actually start to create resolution and source what it is that is creating that emotion. There is a beautiful reason why there's stuff you're surfacing. So if you can actually listen to it and source it and release it, you don't have to revisit it again. And if you do get another depressive episode, believe it or not, it's going to be new this time, which actually makes you feel like you're making some progress, right? So I have a very different perspective on depression and I've, I've been able to effectively work with uh, treating clients without medication because I'm not a doctor with depression um, over and over and over again because of my unique perspective. So Anyone that's struggling with that, you know, you can totally book a free soul connection with me and I'd be happy to support you coming out of that. Awesome. Um, what's the one thing that you do daily that amplifies your ability to stay focused? One of the things that I love doing that I can't do right now because I'm getting over the flu and my energy levels won't let me do it is I have non-negotiable me time in my schedule. And one of the things that I do every day is um, I do some form of workout. So I lift weights uh, and do HIIT workouts five days a week. I walk every single day. So my physical activity and my mother nature time is a non-negotiable because I know how good I feel when I have that win after I finish a workout. It is so good for your mental health when you have those daily wins when everything else in your life might be a slug, like, or you're in the sludge, you're, you're moving a lot more slowly. Those daily wins really help you feel better and help you show up in other aspects of your life. And it's been scientifically proven that time in mother nature is de-stressing. Mother nature heals us. So getting away from our tech and going for a walk in the forest and allowing mother nature to decompress you and heal you. And if you have a weeping willow, you can go hang out under, please do it. Weeping willows are amazing healing trees. They'll wrap themselves around you and the rest of the world just disappears. So what I would say to you, whatever it is that looks like for you, for me, I love getting out of mother nature. I love meditating. I love exercising. There's things that I do, but put non-negotiable you time in your schedule that doesn't look like work or anything. It's just you pampering yourself and giving yourself space. Interesting. You said that about weeping willow. I'll pick your brain after that. I heard something different about the weeping willows. Um, I'll pick your brain about it after. <laughs> if you could pick up the phone right now and call yourself at 20 years old, what would you tell yourself? I totally wrote a newsletter about this. So I've totally been there. Um, what I would tell to my 20 year old self is create a relationship with yourself. Listen to yourself, get to know your body. Don't ignore it. Don't pretend that what's happening to you as a woman doesn't exist. Your womb is a powerhouse and you need to listen to her, not shut her up. Embrace that beautiful brain of yours because it's so much more brilliant than you think it is. You don't think that you're smart, but you're gonna realize you're a philosopher and you're a genius. And you need to invest in yourself and stretch that brain and test it to actually find out what its capacity is. Because up until this point, 
nobody's told you you were smart, so you haven't tested it, but you are beautiful and brilliant at the same time. They do exist in one human. It, it can be a thing, trust me. And really, I know that there are things that you think you're not worthy of because of the childhood that you had, but push anyways. Try even if you think they're going to reject you because really you're going to be surprised as to what you're capable of, what you're going to be able to do and what circles, arenas and places you're going to be able to go to. The only thing that is limiting you is you and you miss 100% of the shots you take. So take the shots and see what happens. Looking back, would you change anything? No, no. I love who I am so much. I mean, I'm here to flood the earth with love. I, I focus on dripping love to everyone that I meet in every way that I can. I call it planting love seeds and being motivated and guided by love and doing the work that I do, transforming lives every day. God, it feeds my soul when I see people thriving and creating a life in service of themselves and their soul singing for the first time in their whole lives. It's just no, because if anything about my life had changed, it would have changed what I'm doing right now. And I just, I wouldn't change a single step. It's so perfect the way it is. Hardship and all, it's perfect. What scares you? Nothing. I am one of those people that because I was in a serious car accident and almost lost my life, unless it's something that can physically harm me, I just say yes and go. Because I know that the worst that can happen is I trip and fall and then I get up and brush myself off and do it again. So I think the only thing that, um, you know, creates potential fear is something that could more like take me out of this life, you know, and, and physically harm me. But outside of that, I, I really let go of fear and that I understand and I teach my clients this as well. When you're feeling nerves, when you're feeling butterflies, when you're feeling fear, it's because you're about to grow. So run into it. Where do you see, where do you see awakened body in the next five years? <laughs> That's so funny because uh, that was something that I actually did uh, and revised earlier this year for myself. Uh, one of the things that I really want to be doing is publishing a book every year. So the books that are behind me, I'm going to add to those. I want to be doing uh, speaking on stages globally. Uh, I co-founded a global coaching association. So, you know, I see myself really digging into, uh, you know, small business owners and into the corporate structure and being able to bring my teachings that are very loved based to help actually influence corporate structure and to support seeing entrepreneurs and people that are wanting to show up for whatever it is that they want to do, you know, really developing a solid foundation so that they can thrive. You know what I mean? So in the next five years, my goal is to really take my teachings global. Very cool. Uh, what about you personally? Where do you see yourself in the next five years? I see myself in the next five years living somewhere tropical and being in a bikini all the time and celebrating 14 years with the love of my life and uh, having another five books under my belt. And I, I have so much that I wanna do. I wanna get singing lessons. Actually, my physical goal is to do a, um, a pistol squat and then I wanna do a dragon squat. That's my big physical goal. Cause if you can, if you can do a pistol squat, I'm just saying. The likelihood that you're going to trip and fall and break a hip is slim to none because you are beast. <laughs> so, you know, I, I have actually gone through and looked at really every aspect of my life personally and professionally and created goals for all of those. You know, I want my friendships to continue as they are. I have beautiful, loving friendships and I want them to continue to blossom. And, you know, I think it's so important the fact that you're asking those two questions separately, your business and your personal life, because I think a lot of people create a lot of goals in one aspect, but they don't honor both. And it is really important to look at nurturing your personal life and your professional life. Do not forget your friends and family while you're building your dream, guys, because I'm telling you, when you have the success and you turn around to have people celebrate it with you, no one will be there. 
it's very possible that no one's actually even going to show up because you forgot about them and you weren't nurturing those relationships while you were actively pursuing your dreams. So don't forget to nurture and support and spend time with those people who love you so that when you are successful, you'll turn around and those people will still be there. <laughs> no, it's, it's um, I'm going to add a little bit to that. You don't know how many times I've asked both those two questions and I get the same answer from the same answer that they asked that they answered the first one with the second one. Oh, exactly. Exactly what I said in the, in the first question. I'm like, no, what about your self? Yeah. This is important. This yeah. is really important. I've got very clear goals for my mental health, my emotional state, my sexuality, my spirituality, hobbies, my romantic life with my partner, my friendships, my child, all sorts of things. So yeah, no, I have so much clarity as to what I want to create for Harmony Woodington in five years and what I want to create for Awakened Body. They're two different things. And they should be because it's important. You can get caught up in your work, especially as a solopreneur, on a self-employed person that you can get caught up in your work and your work starts to define you. It's not a good, it's not, not going to be a good look in five years. Yeah. It's about creating clear foundations for you and your business and creating separate identities for both, which a lot of people don't do in business because people that are doing coaching for uh, people in business, they will have them develop the identity for their business and they forget to get the person to develop their personal identity and personal goals as well. So once you have the two separate you can then walk away from your business at the end of the day and stop talking about your business because you're going to drive your partner insane and be you focus on you. You know what yeah. I mean? That was something that I had to learn because when I published this last book that I just published, I spent way too much time working on my, on my business. So after that was published, I, I created that balance. Very cool. Uh, where can people find more about you? So you can go on to my website, harmonywoodington.com. I'm also on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, LinkedIn. I'm all over the place. And you can literally just look up my name and I will come up. Um, if you would like to book a free soul connection with me, which is literally just the two of us having a conversation so that we can get to know each other better. Um, if you want to know what it is like to work with me, I have um, a holistic package. I have uh, corporate coaching. I have business coaching. I have packages. I've got a bunch of stuff to meet people at different price points, depending on what your budget is. So if you're not knowing where to start and you just want to have a conversation, you can book a call with me. I'll make sure you guys have the link and just say yes and show up and we'll have a conversation. I'll dig in and we'll find a fit that's right for you. That feels good for you so that you're really having somebody who's ethically digging into what your needs are and providing something, knowing you and where you stand. Because too many practitioners are putting things on top of, you know, a foundation and they're not even checking to see if it's sand or quick, like I should say quicksand or cement. And so unfortunately, a lot of the time it's quicksand and the person is then lost going, well, I just spent thousands of dollars and I didn't, I didn't get anywhere. I will never do that to anyone. I do my due diligence and I spend time hearing your story and what your needs are to make sure that what I am going to provide for you is creating a rock solid foundation of cement so that you can build upwards. Cause isn't that what we all want to do? <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Any final thoughts? I just want everyone to really understand that I have I have a divine design and that was something I created for myself. And that is to flood this earth with love, which means that I have cultivated a beautiful, loving relationship within myself and everyone that I work with. I teach you to do the same for yourself and help you become a lighthouse for love yourself. So this is happening through the butterfly effect. I cannot do this alone. I will not do this alone. And if that sounds like, you know, a beautiful way of being, and you want to know what it is like to exist in that space, then come and play with me because I see all of you as beautiful, powerful, divine beings. And I want to see everyone thrive. That is 
really what I'm here for. I show up for my clients with unconditional love and serve them. Oh my gosh, I way over deliver. Really, I'm aware of my clients 24 seven energetically. I'm there for them all the time. They'll have a shift and then I'll text them and be like, what's going on? I know there's something going on over there. And they're like, how did you even know? And I'm like, because I felt your energy shift. And they're like, man, that's insane. So really, I just want you all to know that there is somebody out there who already loves you that doesn't know you yet that wants to see you thrive. And the only thing that I'm waiting for is people who want to show up and say yes to themselves and invest in themselves because I'm already here with all the love for you. Harmony, thank you so much for coming on the show. Um, we've I, I've had multiple conversations with you and um, the, this conversation that we had, especially with uh, understanding the male male mentality and in their, their role and everything. Um, I know you provide so much value to this world, so much hope for, especially during the last two, three years that we all, it has been just one dark, dark shade over another, over another, over another to have somebody like you, like pouring, pouring out their love and their hope and their kindness to, to us. Uh, it's, it's, you're, you're, you're the beacon. You're the beacon, and uh, thank you so much for all the hard work that you put in. I know how how, how much how hard this this line of work really is. So I appreciate you, and um, and if anybody out there wants a better conversation with Harmony, I I failed to uh, say this earlier, but I will post all your links that you've given me in the show notes. So everybody has easy access to you, and I highly recommend at least having a conversation with this wonderful, wonderful human being. Thank you so much, Har Harmony. Thank you so much. Going through hard times is just a test. What you need to know is that when you get out of whatever you're going through, you will be stronger than ever before, and you don't need to go through it alone. Always know that you are not alone. Stay tuned for more real people with amazing stories that are just like yours. Until then, to everyone out there listening, I wish you a good morning, good afternoon, or good night, wherever you may be in this crazy world. Are you a podcaster looking to take your business to the next level? Are you tired of sacrificing your health and wellness for success? Well, look no further than Resilient Reboot Productions, the community that empowers podcasters to build thriving businesses without burning out. Our expert advice and comprehensive resources are designed to help you stay resilient and healthy while pursuing your passion. We provide the support and guidance you need to make us to make smart business decisions, connect with like-minded peers and prioritize your well-being. Don't let burnout derail your dreams. Join resilient reboot productions today and discover how to create a sustainable, fulfilling career in podcasting. With our community by your side, you'll have everything you need to achieve your goals, make a difference in this world, and live your best life. Take the first step towards success. Join Resilient Reboot Productions now.